All right, guys, today's episode is brought to you by Stamps.com, which is a, a wonderful service. Everybody here at Gas Digital uses it. Uh, Stamps.com, it, it provides you with basically all of the services of the post office. You can print postage for any mail class right from your own computer. Uh, the beauty of that is that unlike the post office, it's 24-7, and you don't have to waste time traveling to and from the post office. And everyone in business knows when you're wasting time, you're wasting money. And that's how businesses go out of business. They burn up too much capital. So go to Stamps.com. It's a great service. It makes life much more convenient. Everyone's got to ship stuff. And uh, Stamps.com brings all those great services right to you. So right now, if you go to Stamps.com, they're going to give you a pretty sweet deal, okay? It includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale. All you got to do is go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in problem. At stamps.com, you click on the microphone and you type in problem and you get that four-week trial plus postage and the digital scale. Guys, stamps.com has been sponsoring us for a while. They're helping make this show possible. Do us a favor. Go support the people who support us. Try the service out. Save yourself some time. Add some convenience to your life and help out the show that you love. Stamps.com. You're listening to Part of the Problem on the Gas Digital Network. I think you're the freest country in the world when you lock more of your own people in cages than any other country in the world. The lesson of 9-11 should have been to never fund another young rebel group in this part of the world again. America started as the smallest government in history, and it's become the biggest government in world history. At the end of the day, it's all about freedom. Here's your host, Dave Smith. Oh, hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a brand new episode of Part of the Problem. I am, of course, Dave Smith. We got a great show planned for you guys today. I'm very excited about it. Couple quick announcements first. Uh, I am headed out to Los Angeles first thing tomorrow morning. Uh, the, the podcast and the stand-up comedy show at the Comedy Store have sold out. This is what happens when you don't get your tickets when I first promote it and tell you to. However, if you want to, I'm doing a, a meetup with uh, Jason Stapleton and, and Mark and Brian from the Lines of Liberty podcast. It's called Liberty Behind the Lines. Uh, that's on Saturday, March 31st at 4 p.m. at the State Social House. So you can still come out to that if you want to. Um, and, uh, yeah, then when I return, uh, just a couple more gigs uh, uh, to promote. I, when I get back, I will next month, uh, April 16th, I'll be opening things up at the Soho Forum, uh, which features a debate on fractional reserve banking, a topic made for comedy, between the great Bob Murphy, who's been on the show several times, of course, and, and is just fantastic, and uh, he'll be debating against George uh, Sel Selgin. I hope I'm saying that uh, that name right, but that should be a lot of fun. I know that uh, Tom Woods will also be in the building. And speaking of Bob Murphy and Tom Woods, I am happy to announce I will be going back on the Contra Cruise this year, which I got to say... Uh, is like the most fun thing I've ever done in my life. It's incredible. It's just a cruise full of awesome, brilliant people. And uh, you can go uh, uh, get information for that at ContraCruise.com. And um, th this year it's going to be October 21st through 28th. If you want to come on this thing, and I'm telling you, if you're a libertarian, this is like the best vacation to come on. Move now because th these things always sell out. So, okay, announcements out of the way. I'm very excited to introduce our guest for uh, uh, today's show. I think he's one of like the smartest, most interesting people out there, and I've learned a ton from him about like advanced libertarian philosophy. Uh, Stefan Kinsella, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you, sir? Hey, man, I'm good. Glad to be here. Hey, is it okay if I take notes? Of course, I, I During insist. Okay, yes. right, I might take notes. Oh, okay, yes. <laughs> Believe me, <laughs> I'm I'm the one who's needing to take notes if anyone does. But uh, for people who aren't <laughs> familiar. If if you're not familiar with with Stefan Kinsella, he he's a um, a writer. He's written several great books, right? A ton of amazing uh, articles. He's also a patent attorney. And uh, yeah, for anyone who's not familiar with you, uh, tell us some more about what you do. Yeah, like you mentioned, I'm an agent of the state, as mm -hmm. some libertarians call me for being a patent lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm I'm just a, a a a lawyer here in Texas, and uh, I. I've always loved libertarian thinking, and I write about it when I can. I've got a book coming out in a couple of months uh, collecting some of my essays on this stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of along the lines of uh, rights theory and intellectual property and property theory and contract theory, uh, the things that libertarians used to read when I was growing up, but <laughs> no one reads anymore. 
Yeah, well, you could just uh, leave that statement at no one reads anymore and pretty much sum up our generation <laughs> pretty well. So what I, I'm interested, because you're, you're talking about how you always loved libertarianism, and I'm always interested on, on how people, you know, like kind of became libertarians. Uh, you know, I have a pretty generic hacky story, which is just that, uh, you know, I saw the Ron Paul Giuliani moment, and I was like, that guy's a badass. And then I just got obsessed and, you know, went down this uh, this rabbit hole. But how did you become a libertarian, and when did you realize that we were really all a bunch of secret Nazis? Um, so I, I, so my view is now that like I think that probably the three biggest uh, like feeders into the libertarian movement would be Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman, and now Ron Paul. But that's a more recent thing, and I came into it way before Ron Paul, so he's. Uh, so it was through Ayn Rand, like uh, Tichili says in his book. It usually begins with Ayn Rand. I was in high school at a Catholic school in Louisiana, and a librarian uh, recommended that I read The Fountainhead, and you know, so it started from there. I just got interested in philosophy and um, economics, and uh, and then eventually Rothbard and things like that. Uh, so I was like a minarchist Randian for quite a while, but finally became more of a, uh, of an anarchist. Uh, but I'd say since 1980. Two or so, I'd say I was a, a hardcore libertarian. But before that, I was nothing. I was just some kid in Louisiana with no opinions whatsoever. I mean, I registered Democrat because my parents were blue dog Democrats, and I said, "What should we be?" You know, it's like my mom saying, "Hey, Daddy, who should I vote for?" <laughs> you know, one of these kind of things. Yeah, well, that's that. So it was Rand, I would say. Okay, interesting. Yeah, no, certainly a lot of people, whatever uh, one could say about Ayn Rand, she's certainly reached a ton of people. I've always thought, like, that's that's kind of what I'm always interested in, what the next, you know, person is going to be who reaches a ton of people, like, you know, Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman and, and later Ron Paul did. Uh, I don't know. Ayn Rand did it through novels. I, I have a suspicion that it's not going to be a novelist who is the, uh, the next great uh, converter. I think that's probably right, but I think I, if I had to guess, I think she may still be the number one, even now, recruiting sort of tool. But I, I don't know who else it would be. It maybe it's more maybe it's more diffuse now. Uh, and Ron Paul's influence is kind of fading, right? Rand is not really another Ron, it seems. Um, but yeah, I think you're probably right. Probably probably won't be another novelist. I'm still like Rand Paul is like a. Uh... I feel about him like a, a girlfriend I was madly in love with who cheated on me or something. Because even now, when you just say like a uh, Rand Paul, it looks like isn't going to be a Ron. My, I still sink a little bit in, in my chest, and I'm just like, oh yeah, that's right, he's not. Yeah, I know. But even libertarians who felt like that and they say things like that, then like six months later, they'll start looking at the landscape and they'll <laughs> they give him another chance because they're like, Jesus Christ, he's so much better than everyone else, even though he's he's no Ron Paul. <laughs> It's a weird it's a weird position to be in because you're like uh all uh, it, it the first thing I think of with Rand and I I can't help it is the disappointment and how we had this amazing opportunity to keep the Ron Paul movement going cuz now we got his younger son in there uh and it's like uh, all these things that I'm disappointed about him kind of come out first and then after you take a breath you're like you know he might be the greatest senator of all time. Yeah, I know. And so and then you're thinking yeah but he's uh, the better he is, the less influence you will have, too, right? So it's it's frustrating if you're into politics and that activism of that type, you know, which I'm really not. So it, I'm not I'm never disappointed because I never expect too much. Although um, uh, I think the Trump victory uh, has not failed to deliver on the entertainment <laughs> value of his victory, and even though he's horrible in some ways and libertarians don't like him you know i just i keep saying look just imagine if hillary was in there so you know every day i have a smile on my face when he does there's some news about trump that's always entertaining and some of it's some of it's not horrible even yeah i mean the, i i've you know i i agree with you on that although i've been as of late kind of uh pretty horrified at at you know the uh his yeah. some of his new appointments particularly john bolton and you know, mm -hmm. it, and just the fact that, you know, basically it's there's been a complete kind of neocon takeover and I think the tariffs are terrible and there, there's lots of things that are disappointing. But I still hold on to a little bit of hope that at the very least Donald Trump has contributed 
to kind of degrading the system yeah. and just people. I mean, once you see that a, a, a buffoon like Trump can get in there and that, you know, I mean, I, I like the idea at least that there's something with, with the, the 2016 election where like Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump getting in there and, you know, they just wanted to walk Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush or like Scott Walker or whoever yep. were the chosen people. And the, people are at least seeing through the bullshit of the system a little bit. But I'm trying to be optimistic. Yeah, I, I mean, it seems like that right now, but we have this feeling of dread that when the Democrats come back in power, they're going to forget their skepticism about government, right? Um, but um, yeah, I do this kind of calculus. I'm kind of simple-minded about this. Like, I, I boil it down to taxes and Supreme Court picks too. I think he is better on that than Hillary would have been. So I say, okay, he saved me or the country this much in taxes, and everything he does bad, I take away a little bit. I'm like, yeah, the tariffs are hurting us, but the net is still there, but it's getting it's getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I, I mean, we used to, me and uh, uh, Rob Bernstein, we, we joke about this all the time, but it's kind of like what really sums up uh, to me what it is to be a libertarian in, in 2018 is we'd look at someone like Barack Obama and you go, OK, he's he's the biggest statist in, in probably the history of the world. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I mean, obviously, there's like guys like Stalin and Mao and people like that. But I mean, he controls a far more powerful government and he's like, you know, like the worst thing you could imagine. And then we'll still go, oh, man, thank God John McCain didn't win because that would have been really bad. No. And libertarians keep changing. They keep adjusting their goal lines, right? Like um, uh, they say, they they always correct themselves too. It's kind of annoying. They'll say something like, "Like you can't just say, I prefer Trump to Hillary. You have to be really careful. You have to say, I am. I would be more upset if Hillary won than if Trump won. Like you can't just say something <laughs> normal. Like I have a preference. You have to say, well, she's more evil than he's evil. You can't just say it's better if A wins than B wins. You know, you have to do all these uh, gyrations." Yeah, no, you, you sure do. It's Libertarians are a difficult group to please uh, uh, as a whole. Um, so anyway, uh, what do you think? Because I know that you're, you know, you're like you're, you're an anarcho-capitalist in, in the kind of in the Rothbardian, Hoppian tradition. What do you think, like, in terms of, of the long-term prospects? Because after a while, you, you know, we kind of all get to this point where at least we agree that a private property-based society is the way to go, that the non-aggression principle is like a good moral rule to follow but we also live under this in, in this status world where it seems like no matter who gets elected things just get more and more socialized ron paul always said like this crash is coming and when that comes maybe we'll have a shot to regroup but do you think there's there's like lo more long term like it, is there a chance we get to an ancap world in our lifetimes well okay so here's my here's kind of my take on things i i admire people that know what they don't know and they stick within their own lanes and so i I do know a lot about certain things that I've studied and um, intellectual property and legal theory and things like that. But um, the, maybe one reason I stick to theory is I, I don't know if we can predict the future, and I don't know. I really am always confused about the right strategy. Although you know, early on I was att attracted to political activism and these things, but uh, I think I got disillusioned pretty quickly with political activism because it never works, and I just would imagine. There were guys just like me 10 years, 15, 20, 30 years ago in, in their, having their all-night bull sessions, and they were saying in five years we're going to win, and they were all wrong. They all died with a, a bigger state and more taxes than they, they were fighting against then. So why would I think I'm at any different period of history? And, I, and I'm very skeptical of the political process and political activism, and I'm even skeptical in a sense of intellectual activism in the sense that… You're going to change everyone's views in society or enough people's views that you make everyone just adopt a system. Um, I kind of have the fear that the reason we have what we have is just for um, like political holdout problems and just the, the, the free rider problem and just prisoner's dilemma type problems that are uh, inherent to a large society. So my only real hope is, number one, that people – as we get – Increasingly more technologically advanced and richer, people can basically buy their freedom by just becoming richer in their own lives and just figure out how to navigate around the state. But also, I so I do actually have some optimism despite what I just said. I I sort of think anarchy is coming. It might be a while, but I think it's going to come out only because it's just a natural thing to do because technology has made us so rich and powerful individually. 
that the government just uh, fades away almost in the communist sense. But I don't think it's going to be because you persuade your neighbors or your uncles at Thanksgiving to read the latest Henry Hazlitt pamphlet or whatever. I just, I just don't see that working. People don't read these things by and large because they're not like us. They're not interested in being intellectuals or – um, you know, they're just spending their time on their families and getting, uh, making money and having a career, and their own hobbies. They don't. They're not all. So we can't count on everyone becoming libertarian. We have to. I think the only way it's going to work is not if we nudge it or push it there, but if it makes sense in a natural way. And I think um, that we're going to get there only because of technology. And I don't mean we have to get in rockets and go land on Mars. Because the same thing would happen all over again, right? But now, but I just think over time people are going to get used to the idea of liberty because of the internet, because of just the, um, the, the the antiquated way that all these old laws against homosexuality and religious uh, uh, religious uh, regulations they look so antiquated now. Um, the one thing that I turn to in my life is I always, you know, I lived through 1990 when communism fell, and I just can. It sort of seems to me that. There's a different level of understanding in general in the world now about communism and centralized planned economies. People haven't read Friedman and, and, and these kind of books, but there's a general understanding that we need free markets and that centralized planned economies just don't work. So that event in history was a big teaching moment, um, and so what I'm hoping is that over time just the – as we get more and more used to capitalism and its radical excesses, right, and individual freedom of the West, that we just start taking for granted um, the underpinnings that are going to lead to more and more freedom. So that's kind of my hope, but it, it means that we, we don't really have much to do in our lives as activists except you know, you can keep the torch alive, you can keep the flame alive, you can seek for personal understanding and seek for personal wealth and for protection from the state. So that's kind of my approach to it. Is the kind of a um, a selfish and relatively disengaged point of view. Well, there's it's that that Randian in you comes right back out. Uh, selfishness is a virtue. I know. I know. Uh, so yeah, it, there's something interesting there, and and I agree with with you. Um, I, I think you know there's there's a victory in the sense that like when you'll see people um, who uh, are are you know. Incur you know people who love socialism uh, uh, people on the left who are and even when they talk about socialism now they'll kind of say like oh well you know like Denmark or like Sweden or something like that right. and so there's right. a, there's almost a victory inherently there that nobody's actually arguing for what true socialism is or you know like that the idea that the government should actually own the means of production and there should be no private property and no market so yeah there's certainly something there although I, I mean I guess like in places like Venezuela and stuff like that you still have what could be considered true socialism but you know it's not working out so good uh, for those people yeah I think one, I think one, Jeff Tucker is a good buddy of mine. He he mentioned to me one time something I don't think I'd thought of it this way, but you know originally the socialists claimed that they were going to defeat capitalism because they were more productive. They would make everyone richer. That was the original, you know, Khrushchev banging his shoe on the table. We will bury you. <laughs> yeah. He didn't mean nuke us. He meant we were going to outproduce you. Right. So that was the original claim, and when that became hollow. They switched to social justice, right, and uh, and and, and e e egalitarianism. So that's their new goal. And but no one really, I mean, even China, which calls itself communist, is becoming a, a some kind of capitalist, right? They want to make money. They want to participate in the market. They want to trade. Uh, the people want to get rich. They they're on the internet now. They have their iPhones and 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 um, those other phones that some libertarians use, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. And there still is, though, I guess. Um a lot of ignorance uh, about the history of socialism in the country, and it's it's really, I mean, just, I would say disheartening isn't even a strong enough word. It's just disgusting to see uh, uh, how, how many young people view socialism favorably. I saw the, the other day at, at one of these, you know, marches, well, I forget what they called it, the March Against Guns or the March for, to Save Lives or whatever that they were having the other day, and one of these uh, students, one of the Parkland survivors, is, um, <clears throat> she's wearing like a, one of those communist green jackets with a Cuban flag on it. Yeah. And it's like you guys, right. th th they're like these people who celebrate, uh, celebrate Che Guevara and stuff like that. And you're like, you know, he slaughtered gays, right? Like, like, I mean, there seems to just be nobody teaches anything, it, it seems like, to these young people about like the horrors of socialism. 
Yeah, it is disheartening, and I, I kind of do fear that over time people – it's almost it's almost like the limousine liberal problem, right? These these limousine liberals who – they're very wealthy. They're in, they live in the West, and they take for granted things like you know uh, individual rights, and there's no laws against uh, – uh, uh, you know, miscegenation and things like that, um, and you know, and they can fly on their airplanes around the world to conferences while decrying the use of fossil fuels. They're just totally clueless. And I, yeah, I'm a little afraid. But on the other hand, I don't think freedom will ever be achieved unless it's something that's so natural in the background that most people don't have to uh, learn about it or, or even think about it. They take it for granted, right? Like we take things for granted in the West to a certain degree, a certain amount of liberal. I think even Ayn Rand one time she was asked like. What do you hope for in some future utopian society? And she was like, uh, you know, a society where no one has to worry about politics anymore. Because she was into politics or political theory, but you know, really, in a free society, pe- most people wouldn't. It'd would just be the domain of the specialists. No one would even worry about it because there's no threat to the free market. Everyone takes it for granted, and it's so established and ingrained. But yeah, I kind of fear that that it will get um, um, that people will. Um, They'll, they'll forget. Their memories will get short, right? And they'll start pining for socialism when they're really standing on the shoulders of capitalism, right? I mean, their their education's paid for, their parents made money with a job in the free market and things like that, and they just don't even connect these things up. So in a way, it's like an embarrassment of riches. It's it's a first world problem. It's I don't know how you can avoid that. Yeah, you're, I think you're absolutely right. And there's something really interesting about. Uh, just the irony of being a libertarian is something I've thought about a lot, but it's always like I- I'm obsessed with shit that I think shouldn't exist to begin with. So it's like, you know, yeah. like you'll be obsessed with the wars or the income tax or mass incarceration or any of these things. And you're like, ideally, none of this would exist. And then I do wonder what I would have uh, left to obsess over. Yeah. And not only that, I think the other irony is uh, uh, libertarians are kind of altruistic, right? Because they spend so much time trying to change the laws that would benefit everyone else. But you know, they could just spend that time on bettering their careers and just make the money themselves and say, "Screw off! I don't care about you." So, in a way, libertarians are, and activists especially are very altruistic. They're like, "Don't take that job. Uh, you know, uh, come help us march on a Saturday." I'm like, "Dude, I want to take my kid to a soccer game." Uh, <laughs> so they want you to sacrifice for the for the whole. So it's almost a. That's another reason I'm. A little bit skeptical of political activism because it depends a little bit on – I mean it doesn't depend on the profit motive exactly. It's like an altruistic thing. You're not going to personally benefit so much. I mean you know, I benefited from Trump's tax cuts, but I was a free rider. I didn't contr- contribute to his campaign, Right. so why would I? It's, it's, a, it's a holdout or a free rider problem. Yeah, there is. There, there definitely is something interesting about that and in that uh, libertarians are in general, even though we're like a, a – you know, seen as greedy capitalists that, uh, yeah, there is something tr- like, you know, the, most libertarians I know are, are just concerned with kind of uh, humanitarian goals and, yeah. and just want to, like, help right. other people. Um, so I was uh, transitioning, sh- uh, shifting topics. I was talking about a few episodes ago. I, I did a short episode where I, w- I was breaking down uh, to the best of my ability, but I, I was just kind of discussing uh, argumentation ethics. Uh, which was a, a theory or a, a philosophy put forward by Hans Hermann Hoppe, who's, if not the, one of the greatest living libertarians uh, in the world. And um, I, 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 there was a shorter episode I did, and I, I just realized, you know, I've done like over 300 of these things, and I've, I've still never discussed that. And I find it to be really, really interesting. I think he was really on to something uh, uh, with, with argumentation ethics. And I know we, we chatted on, on Facebook. We messaged back and forth a little bit about it. And I've read a lot of your stuff on it. And I think you're quite a bit better at breaking this down than I am. So I wanted to talk about that with you a little bit. And, and I thought maybe you could give a little bit more of an expert outlook on it. So why don't we just start start from the beginning and just kind of like explain what argumentation ethics is and uh, or your sure. your version of it? No, I actually thought you did a really good job, especially in a short space. Um uh, I just was I was kind of highlighting uh, the scarcity issue bec- or, or the uh, scarce means issue because that's something uh, uh, in recent years I've come to uh, you know over time your arguments and your way of putting things shifts and in the last few years like with the intellectual property thing I've been obsessed with for 20 years now. Um, yeah, I want to talk about that as well. Yeah, so it it all, it all ties in together. But you know, you asked earlier about how I became a libertarian, and uh, I was libertarian already because of Friedman and Rand and Rothbard. 
But like in law school, I was like immer- I was becoming an anarchist around that time, around '88 or so. And Hoppe's um, work on argumentation ethics sort of came upon the scene around that time. There was a big Liberty. Liberty was a big magazine that was popular among libertarians back before the internet, <laughs> like Reason was originally too. Right, Reason was a lot uh, sort of more ramshackle and like a newsletter, but um, it, it was the like all you had was like Reason and Liberty magazine. And Hoppe had this uh, article, and then there was a symposium with about a dozen or so other libertarian thinkers criticizing and commenting on it. And most of them, by the way, were I don't know if you've seen it, but most of them were very um, hostile and negative to his theory. Uh, like Rothbard was basically the only one who adopted it wholesale, but the other guys were all varying levels of, of, of critics. Uh, uh, Tim Verkala and uh, um, uh, I think David Friedman and uh, uh, the Rasmussens, Doug and Den Oil and Rasmussen, Tibor McCann, people like that. Um, but it fascinated me because the the logic of it basically to me is that. Um, well, first of all, he recognized the is-ought dichotomy, which to my mind makes sense. That was a David Hume idea that when you're talking about what people should do, what norms are, what, what, what laws should be, what people ought to do, you're talking about a different category of statements than factual statements like that rock is there, humans have this biology, whatever, and that if you go and if you go from an is to an ought – there's a logical gap. You you can't assume something should be some some way because of the way that it is. You have to insert an odd at some point, which makes sense to me. And uh, but I see no no problem with that because we do have values as humans. Um, you know, we all value some things. That's inherent in the structure of action, which is another reason that the, the Mises, and you mentioned praxeology and, the, and Mises' view of of the, the structure of human action. Um, which to me is an extremely simple point, which is maybe one reason a lot of uh, other other kind of semi-Austrian economists don't respect it that much um, because they think it's too simple. But to my mind, it's very powerful. It has a, a really powerful way of analyzing human action. It's just very simple. Humans, we, we are, we're acting beings. We have intelligence. We have purpose, and we – you and you said you – said, I think something like you act to, to do this, and you're right, but – uh, what you're really doing is you're employing a means. So you you take something you can control in the world that's a means, a scarce means of action or a resource you could think of it or a tool, and you use that to help manipulate the world to change the outcome of the way things otherwise would be in your mind. So you're using means and using intelligence, which is in your head. right? So you're combining those two things. You're using knowledge because you have to have knowledge to be intelligent, to have goals, and to have some idea… Of what will make an effect in the world, like what's a, what's a causal effect in the world? How can I achieve this goal? Like if I want to catch fish, I've got to make a net that's not too fine so that it doesn't stop the water, but not too big so the fish gets out. You know, you have to have some idea of things, but you have to have the resource to make the net, so you have to have both. And we can return to this in a minute, but this unlocks the whole key to intellectual property because you can understand why. You need physical access and control of these things, but you need knowledge too, but one of them is scarce and that you can have conflict over it, and one of them is not. That's why you need property rights over scarce things, but it makes no sense to have property rights over knowledge because any number of other people in the world can use the same idea like getting a net to catch fish. They could all do that at the same time. There's no conflict, so property rights in that idea make no sense, which is ultimately why patent and copyright make no sense. But only I can use this this piece of wood and this, this net at the same time, so there could be conflict over it. So if we want to avoid conflict and get along cooperatively, we have property rights that emerge because of that. So it's just – even the, the praxeological framework helps explain intellectual property. But what Hans was saying was that um, um, when you dedu- when, when you have these when you're when people are trying to get along with each other in society, they want to avoid this conflict that comes about because of scarcity of things like that, right? That we come up with rules and we say, okay, we're just going to have a rule that everyone respects that will say who owns this thing, and therefore, if everyone respects that rule, there, there doesn't need to be conflict over it. Then the owner can trade it. He can use it to make products that he can sell to other people, he can, whatever, um, and that's where property rights come from. And so his insight was simply that what kind of property rights could you come up with that would might satisfy this purpose? 
and which ones could you justify in an argument about it? His point was if you step back and realize that all this discussion about which rights should we have, which property rules should we assign, it happens in the context of two human beings or more actually getting together in a physical context with their two bodies and having a dialogue with each other. And when they do that, they're already respecting certain things about each other. They're already they're already assuming the validity of certain norms, which would be like, all right, I'm trying to persuade you with reason, with what, the force of my words, not with actual force. Uh, I'm not going to kill you if you don't agree with me, Like, and I'm, I'm not trying to coerce you into accepting my argument. And you're sitting there living, so you had to have some control of some resources to do that, and I have to think that you had the right to do that. Otherwise, we couldn't be together having a discussion. So there's sort of these um, these fundamental presuppositions that are normative, moral presuppositions that are part of any discussion whatsoever. So Honda's insight was that you could never advance successfully any kind of argument for any kind of norm that contradicted the very foundation of argument in the first place. So ultimately he, ar he argues that socialism and the various norms of socialism which ultimately amount to I can hit you, but you can't hit me. That's really what socialism amounts to is I basically am your slave owner, and you're my slave and to one degree or the other. But that's contrary to the two people sitting down as independent equal body owners having an argument. So he's just showing that all arguments for anything other than libertarianism collapse because they're self-contradictory. So he's saying it's the ultimate proof, and in, in my opinion, the, the reason a lot of libertarian um, competitors, in effect, disagreed with him was they don't want there to be a final argument. Like they don't like knockdown arguments. They like to play all. You know, they want to argue all night to the wee hours. They don't want someone to get it right. And plus, they're jealous, right? Like we've been, we've been fighting with utilitarian, consequentialist things, inching up to this, saying on the one hand this, on the other hand that. This kind of argument, and then someone comes out and says, "No, socialism is like literally a contradiction." So it's just flat out impossible, sort of like Mises' argument against socialism in economic terms, right? right? So I think they rejected it partly out of jealousy. Who is this upstart young guy? Because he was only in his mid thirties when he came to America. Oh, you were wrong about that fact too. Not not to crit you said in the seventies. He he came to the U.S. in eighty five or so, okay. uh, and he spent. Ten years with Rothbard, the last ten years of Rothbard's life with Rothbard at UNLV and in New York. So um, that's kind of a, a nutshell of the argument, and it's made a it, it sort of had a lasting impression. It hasn't gone away, hasn't died away. There's still a remnant of libertarians who are interested in this, but it never sort of lit the libertarian world on fire in the sense that that's what everyone believes. Partly because so many libertarians are, are basically consequentialist or pragmatist, right? Uh, and a lot of them are, are minarchists, and they don't want something that's going to say the state is uh, inherently by nature criminal and just completely contrary to anything that could ever be justified. Yeah. I, so that's a summary, and it, it really impressed me, and uh, it fascinated me because I, I think it's one of the most um, devastating arguments for libertarianism that gets around this is ought problem I was saying earlier because he never makes – he says this is his, this isn't the value you should hold because I'm giving you a factual argument for it. He says this is the argument you already do hold. Or this is the value that you already do hold, and that everyone that ever participates in in discussion does hold. So if I'm talking to uh, the government who's trying to put me in jail for drugs or for for not paying taxes, they're, they're not having a real argument. They're not trying to justify what they're doing. They're just using force. It's might makes right, right? It's brute force over reason. But they can't justify their views is the point. Uh, it's not that they can't do it, but they can't justify it, which is why one of my favorite quotes is, was by um, um, Papinian, who's a, a Roman jurist, and he says something like, uh, it's easier to commit murder than to justify it. And I think that's basically right. So you can have a factual realm. You can do something wrong. You can violate people's rights, but you can never justify it. You can never have an argument to justify it. Right. Yeah. And, then, uh, you know, Hoppe is such a fascinating guy. I don't I don't know of any other thinker who is more misrepresented both by the his critics and by his supporters. So, like, he's got a whole bunch of like, so, you know, like like the kind of Hoppe and alt right crowd that I'm convinced have never read Hoppe in, in their lives. But like think he's all about like throwing people out of helicopters or something like that. And then his critics are all like, yeah, he's this Nazi throw people out of helicopters guy. And you're like, guys, this was like a joke. Of a meme, it has nothing to do with the guy's actual work. 
Um, but anyway, to what you were saying, and I think that's a great way to, to kind of explain it. There's something very because it was all it was always put in terms of there's the kind of like the um there's like the natural rights argument and then there's like the utilitarian argument and to me it always seemed like although I I had just this kind of gut understanding that libertarianism was the correct way to go it seemed like there were flaws in both and the, the to me the, the consequentialist like utilitarian argument it's just it's kind of obvious that you could think of some areas where it wouldn't be better for the for most people to go in a free. I mean, if we just all rob one person and split that wealth up amongst the rest of us, you will, I guess you could say, have a greater result for a greater amount of people. Um, but we all probably would think there's a moral problem with that. And with the natural rights argument, you know, people just saying, well, you're given these rights by God or you're given these rights by your humanity always seemed like a little bit of a cop out to me. Like I, I was always drawn to that. But like what actual evidence is there that these things are given to us? However, what Hop is able to do is just kind of show by your own action of even engaging in an argument, you are kind of already indicating that you agree with the idea that we should have some type of norms, we can con convince people with arguments, and that we can attempt to avoid conflict, because that's kind of the whole point. Otherwise, you wouldn't be arguing to begin with. Yeah, and, you know, so, like, I think even Ayn Rand one time was asked um, something like, uh, could you really ever say someone should not commit suicide? And I think she or maybe one of her followers, they kind of grudgingly admitted you can't really say that because – Every should, in the Randian point of view, right, is premised upon um, man valuing his life, right? But if you don't value your life, which is demonstrated in Misesian terms, right, demonstrated preference by the fact that you want to kill yourself, you can't get under that and say that there's. So she almost recognized the is odd dichotomy there, by, because re saying that you can't say man should value his life, because what her argument was that the fact that man does value his life. Everything flows from that, and I think, in a, in a sense, she, you know, she, she's right. But if you also think about um, uh, the Mises' type of Austrian economics, right, which has this type of uh, dualism, he called it, which is distinguishing between the causal realm and the teleological realm, the study of the way things work in a causal way in the world, natural science is a scientific method, and studying. The implications of human action, which is purpose driven, and it presupposes people have choice and that we have values and ends, and that we we, we, we choose them that way, right? So that's why economics, praxeology studies the second, uh, but we recognize a realm for the natural sciences. But you see, there's two ways of studying these things. And Hoppe, sort of, because he's such a Misesian and a Rothbardian, in his philosophy, and his libertarianism, he almost did the same thing. He took a type of dualism, right? Like you can say what people do do and what they should do, uh, and one is rights, and one is more like possession. And in fact, Mises has something I didn't discover until recently. I think Tucker pointed out to me. It's in it's in his book Socialism in the chapter on property rights and ownership, which is not a human action. Which is probably why I didn't notice it because he didn't. Re you know, usually you think of human action as like. The kind of uh, the sum of everything he ever did, like his final grand treatise. Um, he actually didn't have some of the stuff in there he had in socialism about about property rights. And also, I think he improved upon so, uh, human action in his last book, uh, or one of his last books, The Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science, which he wrote in like in his 80s. It's my favorite book by him. It's just the best book by him. But in any case, it's about dualism again. Um, in socialism, he pointed out that. You can think of two types of property rights or two types of ownership. One he called catalactic, which means uh, – or economic, and one that was juristic or legal. So even in his mind, he was distinguishing between basically what we would call possession, like the fact of being able to control something, some resource. That's part of human action. You have to have a resource and control it to, to act. Uh, and between the right to own something, which is what the law recognizes and what is socially recognized in a social setting. So even Mises was recognizing this. So Hans is just distinguishing these things, Hans Hoppe, and treating them uh, differently. Anyway, you can see I'm getting a little geeked out here. <laughs> I didn't mean to go too far, but yeah, this stuff has fascinated me ever since I came across this little anecdote. I was in law school. I was in my first year class. Maybe it was 80 eight, I think, and I was in contracts class, and there's this concept called estoppel, which I've written on myself. I use that for some of my own theories about rights, and estoppel just means the court won't let you say something that is inconsistent with your previous action. They say you're stopped 
which means you're stopped or prevented. So it, if you lead someone to believe that you had a contract with them and they rely upon it, even though you didn't satisfy all the criteria in the law, in the regular law for a contract, like you're missing consideration or something like that, the court – in equity, right, which means fairness, in an equity court, they would say, well, we're still going to prevent you from suing this guy. We're going to stop you from saying there was no contract. Even though there was no contract under the regular law, the formal law, we're going to stop you from saying that because it contradicts what you led this guy to believe. So. As soon as I read that, I was thinking this is very much like Hoppe's argumentation ethics because – and it's like libertarianism, right? Because libertarianism is all about um, the symmetry between um, an act of force. That's why we our, – our, our kind of initial in, intuitions I think that resonate with those of us who are sort of principled libertarians is this idea of the non-aggression principle, which is that you can only use force in response to force. You can't use force if you're starting it because anything you're start if you're starting force, you're using force in response to something that's not force. Like if you insult me, right, or if you start a business that competes with me, you're not using force against me. So I don't have a right to make a law about it. I don't have the right to use force. You see the symmetry that's inherent in that is that force is permissible, and it is permissible, unlike uh, what pacifists would say, right? We, Force is, we're not against force or violence. We're just against initiated, which is a shorthand for saying we believe in the uh, we believe in property rights assigned according to the rules uh, I mentioned earlier, right? Of first use and contract, basically consent and the first guy that uses it. So basically, I, I saw right away that there's a kind of a, a kernel of intuitive understanding in this classic legal idea of estoppel, right? Which courts use intuitively in equity cases with the with the basis of libertarian uh, reasoning as well, right? Uh, I can use force against you, but only if you use force first. So there's a symmetry there. So, and that's what Hoppe's argumentation ethics is getting at as well. You cannot initiate force against someone else um, because the premise of any discussion is a peaceful, a peaceful dialogue between people who respect each other's space, basically. Right. It's a, it's very interesting because I, I've always noticed uh, uh, in general with libertarians, and obviously you know 99.999% of them aren't as smart as Hans Hermann Hoppe, but just in general with people who are attracted to libertarianism, it seems to be people who are really um, interested in being consistent. And one of the things that you see with just yeah. about every other political philosophy is people don't really care about being uh, inconsistent. Like, you know, the the Republicans and Democrats and, you know, right-wing, left-wing guys, you just see these inconsistencies all around. Yeah. They don't even seem to care about it. And that's, I think, part of what draws me so much to this kind of Hoppian argumentation ethics thing. I, I think – well, I was actually talking about something very similar with Jeff Tucker this morning. We talk a lot on the phone. We're talking about I, – like libertarians, and I'm one, but we almost have an autistic almost uh, or OCD obsession with consistency, which I admire, and I'm, I'm with it. But I think most people you know, they have their day jobs, and they're just not that interested in philosophy, and, and that's why if you talk to a conservative or something, and they'll, they'll say, yes, I, I, I believe in liberty. It's, it's an important value. Among many, you know, and they say that so they'll have an excuse to infringe on it later, right? But basically, they're not that obsessed with consistency because if you point out, well, but you believe in the drug war, and they'll say, well, because people, and then they just have an excuse, right? But they right away they're off of their liberty point. But we're like, no, no, you have to hammer this thing out into the ultimate ends. Um, so, yeah, I, I think consistency is is really that's why I always think that to be a libertarian, you just have to be relatively smart. You have to have a passion for consistency, and you have to know a little bit about economics. right? So if you have a basic economic literacy, like on the level of, of Hazlitt's economics in one lesson, then you start realizing, well, you know, the minimum wage might sound nice right? from a high-level uh, 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 sales pitch by uh, you know, Krugman or, or, or someone. But when you think about economics, supply and demand, just the basic laws of economics, and you know what this is going to do… And you care about liberty, and you think like, – like Bastiat said, right? Like we just think that you can't have the government do something that people can't do, and most people would say you shouldn't steal from each other. You shouldn't commit murder, but when the government does it, you know, when they commit conscription or they commit war or they tax you, they say, oh, well, that's an exception. That's different. 
Right. So I think, yes, lack, lack of consistency uh, is, is the big problem, and lack of economic literacy is another one. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think that, uh, you know, Hazlitt's book, uh, Economics in One Lesson, it's still to this day, like, it's, it's the best book to recommend as, like, a starter on economics, if someone's like, you know, like coming from not really knowing that much and they're interested in these ideas, you know, you don't want to throw a man economy and state right away. Like there might be books that are actually no, no, a little, no, no, no. There, there are books that are a little more detailed. I think Thomas Sowell's Basic Economics is a really great book. And there, there's other ones that are, are great. But there's something about that one lesson that Hazlitt gives you that you, you can, it, it's almost like a tool where now you can see through a lot of the bullshit that'll be thrown at you. I mean, I've gotten into arguments with, with left wing people who will, you know, they'll, you know, just say things like um they're like oh well you know uh social security is, is a great idea because uh you know i remember after the uh the 2008 recession or people are like man if it wasn't for social security a lot of these old people would would be uh below the poverty line and now they're not and if you've read Hazlitt, you can just go right but where did we get that money from we tax it from young people who are actually a poorer demographic than the old people so this can't be correct it's just like one simple insight that allows you to sm smack down like 90 percent of the the government propaganda uh, on economics. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And uh, I, there's a couple others in sort of my upbringing that I'd put almost on the same level, but not quite. I think that's the main one. But like the law by Bastiat yeah, and the economic sophisms, um, and also Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom, which just to me was it's just basic economics, right? And then also Ayn Rand's I think Capitalism: The Unknown Ideal has a lot of basic economic stuff which kind of opens your eyes to all these you know the lies that the mainstream the mainstream types tell so but yeah i agree and there's probably others like you said like so and there's probably even nowadays there, there may be better ones out there that yeah. people have written in the meantime maybe some of bob murphy stuff or um or other new primers or primers or however that word is said <laughs> so it's it's interesting like the um there's something because it you know like so milton friedman or somebody like that who you know i um I know there's there's like a big division between the the Austrian economics, like the Mises guys and the Chicago boys, yeah. and I I know there was a lot of like bad blood between Rothbard and and, uh, and and Friedman, and you know probably some of that stuff is is like silly, and some of it is is legitimate. But regardless of that, I mean, I always there's like. I mean, Milton Friedman, uh, if you're talking about just, like, introductory things, like, I mean, I, yeah. I recommend – go watch him on Donahue. He's just yep. unbelievable. It's, like, some of the best yep. stuff you could ever watch in your life. And and I think with Ayn Rand, too, like, I loved her Donahue appearances as well. And, there again, it is that thing that we were talking about before where it's, like, if, if you're drawn to consistency and you're, like, reasonably intelligent. You don't have to be a genius. Like, but if you're, if yeah. you're drawn to consistency and you want – like, there's something about that that's appealing. But – I guess this is why I, uh, w once I found Rothbard and guys like that, I was just like, oh no, this is this is where it's at, is because it does seem like where they diverge, where where Friedman and 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 Rothbard diverge, it's like. Oh yeah, Rothbard was just that much more obsessed with being consistent than even you are. Like he would just take it to that final five percent or whatever, and just he'd be like, "No, no, no, we're we're going all the way with this consistency thing." Whereas even those guys would, it seems, when push comes to shove, uh, would would go like, "Okay, there's this one exception to the entire thing that we've been building here." Yeah, I think I think the consistency thing might explain the, the political difference more so than the economic. So, for example. Like Friedman's son, David Friedman, kind of has the same uh, uh, mainstream economic positivist outlook on economics, but he's just more consistent in his politics, so he became an anarchist. So I think Rothbard's anarchism is probably attributable to just being more consistent about politics. But the main difference with Friedman, I think, would be economic, and I agree with almost all those criticisms. I think his positivism – is logical positivism, right? This idea that you do economics by empirical testing, and it, I think it just it collapses dualism. That's why I'm a Misesian, and I think Mises is, is basically, um, I, uh, to my mind, the great thinkers in, that you need, right? Plus a little basic economic literacy, which you can get from Friedman because that book and his Free to Choose, they're, they're great. Uh, um, but I think to me it's Mises and Rothbard and Hoppe. Um, just with this hardcore emphasis on both all praxeology and also on, especially for the latter two, right, Rothbard and Hoppe, on um, uh, kind of a libertarian, uh, kind of a political realism about the nature of the state, right? I mean, Mises held on to this minarchist kind of 
kind of view, right? Uh, you need a draft. You need some minimal state. You know, sometimes you have to fight a war against the Nazis. You can understand his old world mentality, but uh, then Rothbard got more radical, and then even Hoppe got more radical than him. Rothbard sort of was a, a, a I don't want to say a middle period libertarian because he was basically the foundation of modern libertarian thought, I believe. But even he, as Hoppe pointed out in this uh, – I think it was in the introduction to um, the 1998 edition of, of Rothbard's Ethics of Liberty, um, he pointed out that Mises and even Rothbard ha had this kind of nostalgic um, pro-American and pro-democratic view. Like this kind of assumption that democracy was an improvement when we went from monarchy to democracy, and that the original American founding was kind of quasi-libertarian. I, I mean really you have to make a lot of excuses for the deviations to say that. I mean you could say except for the slaves I mean, yeah, sure. and except for the conscription of the war and except for the expropriation of the British subjects' property, you know, and except for the women not having the right uh, property right, you know, except for all those things, it was a quasi libertarian paradise. I mean, it's just untenable, I think, you know. Um and also the view that democracy was some un unalloyed improvement from the previous world order, which is kind of these uh these these uh these parliamentary monarchies. Um which which is why Hoppe got kind of famous after his earlier works for his democracy view, right? And for his anti uh anti democracy work, which again, like you said, his his critics and some of his fans um mis misattribute what he says. He he actually never said that he was a monarchist and he's not a monarchist. He just was pointing out how monarchy was not inferior to democracy in some respects, you know, which is a reasonable right. uh, point to make. But this is why I made the point that I feel like those those uh, critics, or or even in some point, it's those like proponents of him. I feel like they haven't read the book. The book "Democracy: The God That Failed" is unbelievable. I highly recommend it. I think it's one of the best books I've ever read in my life. It's like it's a masterpiece. Like every chapter stands alone, but it also still builds to this incredible argument. But there's no way you could read it and think he was actually advocating for monarchy because he disclaims it. Like dozens of times in the book, he keeps yeah, explicit, mentioning explicitly, yeah, explicitly. Like, yeah, like he keeps right. saying, like, no, 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 I'm not arguing in favor of monarchy. I am for a private property-based society. However, if you want to compare monarchy to democracy, monarchy is preferable. And and he he uh, addresses the fact that it's basically just an accepted given in modern society yes. that that was an improvement and it's like well let's actually look at this and it's a fascinating argument what he what he basically uh, uh, argues is that because monarchs uh essentially owned their their governments they would act as property owners whereas uh politicians in democracies are temporary decision makers so they're kind of incentivized to do things like i don't know rack up 20 trillion dollars in debt because yeah. they're just passing out favors while they're in there and then they're gone if you're a monarch and you're passing 20 trillion on to your kid you might be like eh, actually let's not go that way and then in addition to it i think there is you know, and this is kind of like what Rothbard touches on, although he didn't he he didn't take it to where Hoppe did. The idea that you know, in, in just Anatomy of the State, which is also one of the first things I recommend to people, um, it's yep. democracy has been able to convince people of this illusion that I don't think monarchy was ever able to. Like monarchy, it's just kind of like, yeah, this is this guy asserting that he rules all of us. Uh, whereas in democracy, people buy into this bullshit of like the government is us and we are the government and they, they were chosen yep. by the majority, therefore they must be great. Well, not only that. I mean, so I think that, uh, and that's Hans. Hans emphasis. I don't think that none of those all his original insights, but he emphasizes this stuff repeatedly. That yeah, so the, the, uh, the, the democracy can get away with more plunder of the people because they're under this delusion that we are the government. We have the right to vote, after all. You can't complain, and there's nothing you can do. You can't kill. You can't kill the head of state. There is no head of state anymore. It's dispersed. Whereas in a monarch, at least if you have a if you have an idiot or an evil monarch who's born and inherits a crown, he could be uh, – everyone, all his advisors and his uncle, they all sort of take care of things for him, and they keep him under control. And if he gets bad enough, he can be killed, right? And, and people know that they're not the government. They know that's the monarch, and that's us. So he can only get away with so much taxes. Like, wait a minute. I thought you're supposed to be giving us protection for these taxes. And so there's a limit. There's like more natural limits to this, but – um but um, yeah, so th that's one. I agree with you. That's one of his great contributions. Um, 
I, by the way, uh, I talk a lot about this uh, just for viewers' reference. Uh, I did a Mises, you know, Mises Academy is this kind of I guess it's still going on, but they do these online courses. And I did three or four a few years ago, and I did one on I did like a six lecture course on Hoppe's whole social theory. So it's all free on my website now. So if anyone wants to look into this stuff in more detail, I have you know six lectures going in detail about a lot of Hoppe's um, Hoppe's views. Yeah. Okay, yeah, highly recommend it. Um, and uh, of course, Mises is Mises uh, Institute is the greatest organization in the history of the world, and I highly recommend everyone go check them out. I'm rocking one of their shirts right now. Um, but you know, there is, and and this is just kind of I think too uh, to to kind of back up Hoppe's argument, which again, it's just taken as a given that moving away from monarchy toward uh, uh, democracy was like a um, was, was an improvement in the human condition. And of course, things did. I mean, the, the standards of living at this point are higher than they were under monarchy but uh, uh, just to kind of you know contribute to that argument and to also uh point out you know the the problems that come along with regime change and uh, uh going out and and getting in wars to overthrow other governments so which obviously we see a ton of right now in the middle east like nobody's really defending uh what a great guy saddam hussein was or but obviously iraq's a lot worse now and it's a lot worse in libya without Gaddafi, and and now we have slavery uh uh rising up in libya uh, or not rising up it's risen up at this point um but you know and i, I remember pat buchanan made this point in his book pat buchanan's a guy who i don't agree with on a lot of stuff but i think he he makes some very interesting points but you know Woodrow Wilson, the original, the original neocon, if you want to think of it that way, the guy who said we're going to make the world safe for democracy, and we went into World War One. They had basically Europe was ruled by monarchs. Not to say that they're great people or that this was the ideal system, but after uh, the monarchs fell, you had you know the rise of Lenin, then Stalin. You had the rise of Hitler. I mean things undeniably far far worse than than the monarchies that that came before them. And so it's it's interesting that no one really looks at that. Yeah, and I think you know we've had this sort of egalitarian revolution and this sort of uh, human uh, you know people couple things together and so they they associate the modern Western system with the modern liberal uh, traditions that we have now, understandably, right? So they think that if you if you want to go back to monarchy, you want to go back to uh, the old ages and you know especially libertarians like. I'm not, not going to have a monarch. No one owns me. It's like, yeah, but the, the democracy doesn't own you either, but we're putting up with that too, right? Um, I think it's partly a case of mistaken um, you know, causation versus correlation. It's almost like the intellectual property system, right? So we had the Industrial Revolution start around 1800, right around the time America came onto the scene, and right around the time we instituted a patent system, and the wealth just went up geometrically for the last 200-something years. And so when you say we should get rid of patents, they say, are you crazy? It was the cause of American um, success and innovation, which I think it's just cause, it's correlation, not causation, right? And maybe the same thing is true with you know, democracy became – well, I guess democracy didn't really hit the scene until after World War I really so much. Um, but yeah, people correlate the modern Western systems, right? Um, and uh, you know, I don't know what to believe about uh, this, this notion that – like R.J. Rummel, I think the guy from the the democide guy, you know, the guy from Hawaii, the professor who's collected all these statistics about um, what type of regimes kill which people and how many they killed in the 20th century and these things, which is just staggering murders, clearly mostly by state systems, communism and you know fascism. But so he concludes, you know, democracies are usually less prone to go to war against each other. I, I'm not sure if that's right. I, it could be that. Democracies tended to be the ones that are more Western and British and therefore capitalist and richer, and therefore they could just exert their will and dominate the world as the U.S. has done for the last 70-something years. Right? Um, so it's hard to, to sort these things out, but um, I, I suppose democracy – if every country in the world was a democracy, may, maybe they could get along, but uh, they would still be taxing the hell out of their citizens, right? So <laughs> they still wouldn't be totally fair. Right.
Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, you touched uh, you touched on patents again there, and I do I I, I want to talk about uh, intellectual property with you because you you were really the guy who kind of helped me understand this stuff. And I this was something that I used to struggle with when I first became a, a, a libertarian. Um, because there's kind of there's this thing about intellectual property that didn't quite make sense to me and didn't fit into this kind of the worldview of the non-aggression principle. Like I could clearly see the example I used to use is just that kind of like a, I, I was like if you you know if if you're living in some kind of primitive society somewhere or say say there is no government there's no cops there's no laws or anything like that but if somebody like a you know, like collected some some woman goes out and collects some seashells and makes like a, a necklace out of it, and then someone comes over and bashes her over the head and takes that. It's pretty easy to see that she was the rightful owner and that something immoral has kind of been committed against her. However, if if someone goes out and collects some seashells and makes a necklace out of it and now says, I'm the owner of seashell necklaces. I have the right to bash anyone else over the head who goes out and makes a necklace out of seashells. Eh, now it kind of seems like she's being the aggressor, and this isn't really consistent with libertarianism. And the other thing that always, you know, I'm a stand-up comedian, and intellectual property is something comedians kind of know about because we all feel a sense of ownership over our jokes. Um, but it always kind of seemed pretty obvious to me that it was like, I mean, two people can come up with the same joke independently. So who really stole something from someone there? And we have nonviolent ways of dealing with it. Like if people know that you're ripping off another comedian, people won't have you work at their club and things like that. But I, I always had an had a um like an instinct that intellectual property was not consistent with libertarianism, but it wasn't until I read your stuff that I felt like I actually understand it. So I, also, I, I, I love the connection you made at the beginning to, to praxeology and intellectual property. Yep. So why don't you just you know talk about that a little bit? What's your stance on intellectual property? Yeah, um, and, and also comedians learn things from earlier comedians and other people in the culture, so they're Everyone's always borrowing to some degree, yeah. right? Scientists, engineers, inventors, uh, artists, they always are in the middle of some phase of human development. They're using information before, and it just something wrong about being able to learn to use this whole body of human knowledge that you've just lucked onto because you were born in the 21st century instead of you know, 200 AD. And then you, you want to take the ladder out and not let anyone else use your stuff. Um, um, yeah, so I do agree it can be confusing, and it took me a while to sort out the right way to explain it. And that's why I've, I've written about it over the years, and I've adapted and modified and learned new arguments. And I, I think um, one is the human action paradigm, just understanding that in human action there's two things you need. You need knowledge, and you need scarce resources, and then I've already explained why property rules make sense for one, not for the other, right? Um, but the other one I think is maybe a fundamental mistake, and I talk about this in a lecture about Locke, John Locke, whose idea was that – and a lot of libertarians hark back to John Locke because he's sort of like a, a, a natural law theorist everyone kind of points at. But the way he, he, way he argued was – number one, was religious, so he's, you know, he's taking God, owning the world, and giving it to Adam, and God granted us the right to own ourselves, so he's taking that for granted. Um, but then he said if you own yourself, then you own your labor. And therefore, you own things you mix with it that are unknown. So this whole thing, he was trying to justify property rights against arbitrary interference by others. But his argument basically introduced this labor theory of value or labor theory of property to the world, which I think spun off and eventually resulted in, in basically communism, the idea of the labor theory of value, right? the idea that the reason – Things have a value is because people put time and effort into it. And you're sort of infusing it with your labor. It, these things are like cousin ideas. Like it's a metaphor that went wrong. You don't own your labor. Labor is just another word for a type of action, and action is just what you do with your body. You own your body, but you don't own what you do with it. And I think that that led to the so the notion you had about look, I'm a creator. Uh, uh, I, uh, someone got stolen from. That's why it's wrong. And so. You tend to you tend to identify economic productivity um, with property because they often go together, and so you think, well, the reason this woman is successful and prosperous is because she labored hard and she created something worth value, and therefore it's wrong for someone to steal it from her. And those things are 
as far as we – they're mostly correct, but they, 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 they mix some things together that are not correct. And, and the, the, the mistake made from that sort of first-level analysis is the assumption that um, we own what we create. Right? It's the idea that one source of ownership is creation, and I think that's a fundamental mistake that people make in political theory and just in common sense reasoning. What they're not – it's one reason I brought up the Mises distinction between um, practical ownership or control of something, which we would call possession, and legal, right? which is a normative thing. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a, there's a dualism in understanding property and wealth. Wealth is just the increase of value to us in a subjective sense, whereas property usually refers to resources that we can control in a possession sense. Right? And so if I, if I take a natural resource that I own, um, like just a simple example would be like an iron ore or maybe a big slab of marble, and then I carve it into a statue or I make the, the iron ore into a, a horseshoe for a horse… I have increased the sum total of wealth in the world because I've made this thing more valuable. So people naturally want to have property rights to protect that. But if you think closely about it, you haven't created any new property. You've just rearranged things that you already had to own. You had to own the marble to carve it into a statue. You had to own the iron ore in order to reshape it into a sword or to a horseshoe. So there's already property rights there, and the reason you own the resulting product is because you already own the input ingredients. And in fact, that's the reason why Marxism is wrong when they say that the capitalist employer exploits the labor of the worker because they say, well, he produces all the horseshoes on the assembly line, so he's, he doesn't get the full value of that because he's only getting paid a salary that's a fraction of, of what it's being sold for. That he's being stolen from because the assumption is that well, if he created the horseshoes, he should own them. You see, that's that's wrong. He didn't use his own resources to create the horseshoes. He was paid for his labor by the employer to use the materials supplied to him by the employer to make the horseshoes or whatever he's making. Right. So you can see that creation is never a source of ownership. It's only a source of wealth, and that is important. But creation just means production, or it means transformation. Or in a simple way, it means rearrangement. I mean, even Ayn Rand and Mises and Rothbard explicitly say this, but they never quite connect the dots. But you own some resource which you got either by contract from a previous owner or you found it yourself. That's called uh, homesteading. So there's really only two sources of ownership, and that is homesteading. That means you find something unowned, uh, or or um, or by contract from a previous owner. They give it to you. They sell it to you. But production is a way of transforming these things that you already own and creating wealth for yourself or for the world, which is true. But it doesn't give rise to property rights. And if you don't make this mistake, then you never make the mistake of thinking, well, if I create something like I make a new horseshoe, it's wrong for someone to steal it from me. That must mean you own whatever you create, and hey, I just created a novel or a joke or an invention. And that has value, so it's wrong for someone to steal that from me too. So you get confused by this original mistake, I believe, or by this mistake that's been woven into the, 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 the dawning understanding we've worked out the last three, four hundred years in you know, human uh, political philosophy. Well, that's, that's a really interesting connection. And yeah, okay, so I, I get that completely. So in other words, so in a libertarian society, or just the correct libertarian position to have, is essentially that if you, uh, um, if you own a material and you improve it, then you own it. If you don't, it's whatever the agreement was when you, when you work to, to improve it. So in other words, if you like, uh, um, well, let's say it this way. Like, here's like the challenge. So if you, uh, you write a book, Let's just say for the sake of argument that you own the book, right? Uh, and and you, it's blank, and then you write a, a book within that. Uh, what if somebody else comes along and writes the exact same book as you? It was property that they own there now. Would you say – and I know I already agree with you, but I just want to set you up to explain this. Would you say that you have no legal recourse to that person who is now selling a book that was your thoughts that you put on this paper? Well, okay. Yes, but uh, the, the, the one problem with the example is, um, as copyright advocates rightly point out, um, copyright usually covers things that uh, 
So patents cover invention. Right. They cover things that in almost every case are inevitable. In fact, there's usually multiple inventors chasing the same idea because the, the technology is ripe for the next thing to come about, right? So the airplane or the electric, the, the light bulb, things like that. Um, almost every, It's hard to think of an invention that you would say would never have been invented if not for this guy. If he had been hit by a bus, someone else would have come up with it. Um, so it's hard to think of independent invention. Maybe you come up, come up with it earlier, but it's going to come anyway. Uh, it's easier to argue for copyright that like no one would have written um, uh, you know Great Expectations by Dickens. No one would have written Atlas Shrugged. It's just too unlikely. Uh, so it's hard to or the or draw or painted the same exact painting. Now for jokes it might be different because some of them are tropes and they're shorter and they can be worded in different ways. So it's a general idea, but um, but I think the fundamental idea is that um, there's. Even if you copy exactly what someone else did, like you copy their novel, and even if you put your own name on it, there's really nothing inherently wrong with that. Um, it might be a little seedy and shady, and it could be deceptive in some cases, and libertarians are way too quick to say well, it's fraud. Like if you lie about something, it's right. fraud. And, but even if it was, it would just be a fraud claim against whoever was deceived against the fraudulent seller or something like that. It wouldn't be a general right of property, a get good against the world. Like I could copy the latest Harry uh, Potter novel and truthfully say, J.K. Rowling wrote it. I'm just going to sell copies. I'm not committing fraud. I'm not even lying. I'm not even saying I have permission. I'm just right. doing it. There's no fraud. And I think fraud is a very specific libertarian offense that you have to understand contract theory. And property theory and libertarian consistent principles to even know what fraud is, and I think fraud is a very narrow thing. And most times when libertarians even say, well, that's just fraudulent, what they really mean is it was dishonest. And you know what? They may be right to criticize someone for being dishonest. Like if you plagiarize a paper at your school, well, you're not following the rules of your school. You know, like let's say I copy a chapter from uh, from from Shakespeare and I just put it as my own. That's plagiarism. And I don't know if it's exactly fraudulent. Your teacher's not paying you for it. So there's really no fraud claim there in, right. in, the, in the strict sense. So you just have to say it's, it's sort of like the comic thing you mentioned. Like there's norms, and you know you don't want to hear a comic that's borrowing his stuff from other people. You want to hear fresh material. You want to hear their voice. Right, right. It, because they're, they're going to get a bad reputation. Right, because like I was I was laying out with the the idea of jokes. I mean, there there are things where there's parallel thinking. Like there are great comedians who have done like basically the same joke. Uh, uh, Brian Regan and Jerry Seinfeld had a joke that they both did, like it, it, about the mm -hmm. man on the moon. But it's a great joke by both of them. But it's just something that they came up with that it wasn't the most complicated thing in the way, and they're both really funny, so they went to the funny place with that. However, there are other examples um, where people are clearly ripping other people off, and they're taking like the, yeah. their nuance and their timing and the exact words and this and that. And I think the point that what, what it comes down to when you're saying it, it, uh, intellectual property – uh, basically isn't a property right. Uh, it, it's that, you know, when we're talking about property rights, we're saying, as you laid out earlier, it's not that we're against violence, we're against initiating violence. So the question is really, are you allowed to, to act violently against somebody? Like, if they break into your home, you can shoot that person. So the question isn't so much like, is this seedy or is this wrong? It's should we be throwing someone in a cage for this? And I think, again, like like we were saying with the comedian thing, it's like, yeah, you can have libertarian solutions to this, which is that if you do blatantly rip somebody off, the clubs kind of stop working you, people out you as being this person. So if someone was doing that, like stealing somebody else's his book or something like that, I think the appropriate response is for publishers to not want to work with this guy, people to kind of out them. But it wouldn't be a legal claim where you can actually go steal money, you know, like where you can say, oh, this guy owes you money or this guy needs to be locked up or something like that. Um, well, and, and people people need to realize that you know, we have a, a large public domain right now. Like everything published before a certain date is public domain. You know, Shakespeare, the Bible. Right. There's no barrier, no legal barrier to you republishing Shakespeare's works or Plato or Aristotle or Francis Bacon, you know, all this stuff. You can publish it right now on Amazon or, or anywhere on the web and put your name on it if you want to, and there's just no claim, and yet people don't do this. So everyone's freaking out about a problem that just like never happens. I mean, why aren't there a million people claiming they wrote the Bible or, or Shakespeare? <laughs> it's just not going to happen because everyone knows who wrote it, and you're just going to look like an idiot. And you're, we, we talked earlier about the symmetry that libertarians obsess about in the non-aggression principle and the consistency, and the, the idea that you can only use force 
in response to force, initiated force in, in particular. Well, we libertarians recognize that all law is ultimately the use of physical, real force, and it's always against some real thing in the world. And if you if you just say why why can't you have a law like there's this notion among IP advocates, even libertarians, that it's just another right. It's in addition to our other rights. But what they don't understand is that all rights or legal rights, which are enforced by physical force, and they have to be directed at some physical resource. That's just what force is used against. So actually my argument is not that intellectual property is unjustified. It's that it's impossible. There, it is, it's legally impossible for there to be a right in a, in a pattern of information. What, what that is is… It's just a disguised way of transferring existing ownership of existing things. So for example, if I have a copyright, I can stop you from uh, – or I can sue you for damages for you know, copying my novel. I'm just going to get physical force of a government court to take your, your money away from you. So it's really the contest is about the money. Right, or if I have a patent and I'm going to I'm, – I'm Apple, and I'm going to keep you from making um, a, a, a rectangular-ish touchscreen phone… With rounded corners because of my design patent, I'm just trying to get physical force from the government against your factory, which means they're claiming partial ownership of this competitor's factory, which is another physical thing. So all these things are always about who controls physical resources, and if you already have two rules that specify who owns these things, which is who got it first, who got it by contract from a previous owner, then you have to have a third rule… Which is undercutting the first two. It's very similar to what I pointed out before. Um, the, the same reason that libertarians oppose monetary inflation by the government, and we oppose what's called positive rights. Like liberals and uh, mainstream people think, well, we believe in the rights to security and uh, et cetera, but we also believe in the right to welfare and education and, and housing. It's like we libertarians where I say, no, it's a positive right. It's got to be provided by someone, and it's got to come at the expense of negative rights that we have. We know that, and if you have money and the government just prints more, hey, what's wrong with the government just giving free money to people? Because it dilutes the purchasing power, power of the existing money and makes us all poor. It's stealing our purchasing power, and exactly in the same way is when the government creates other rights like intellectual property. It's taking away and eating at… The existing allocation of property rights in physical things, you can never have physical property rights and intellectual property. The intellectual property is just a way of shifting these other ownership rights and it's basically stealing it under the uh, under the guise of calling it property, which is just obscene. right? You call it intellectual property so that the, the, the act of theft there is masked or distorted. Right. No, that's actually, I think, the, the best way to think about it, because it really is just another positive right, which almost in, in theory, if you didn't have to violate all of the negative rights in order to provide it, it'd be like, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I guess that sounds great. Like if, you, if printing money did create wealth, you could just spread it around. It sounds like a nice idea. The problem is you have to rob from, from the prior in order to provide the latter. So I'd say – Yeah, wait, let me – Go ahead. Another way to think about it is if you – you know, all these pro property rights – like uh, your right to your house or your car, um, like no one in – what state do you live in? <laughs> I'm, in I'm in New Doesn't York. matter, but – where? In New York City. Okay, so New York law prohibits theft of your car and, your, and, and trespass against your house, but even someone in Texas or in Russia can't – they can't actually violate your house or your car, right? They have to travel there and do it, but – IP patent and copyright law are inherently territorial. So I might have a cop I might have a patent on my invention in America, but not in China if I didn't apply for it. And if you even think broader, like let's say there was a colony on the moon or an, or another let's say there's another planet out there and there's an identical copy of one of Rand's novels or someone's doing the same invention, it's not even conceivable that they're infringing my property rights here. But you can't conceive of someone like Infringing my property rights in my car or my house on another planet without me noticing. It just makes no right. sense. The entire paradigm makes no sense uh, to try to analogize. And, and what, what I see some pro-IP guys do, some libertarians like Richard Epstein and others, 
they'll say something like, well – and Adam Mossoff, the objectivist guy who's like all about trying to finally put IP on a sound footing after Rand failed to, and he's never going to either because I tried already, and I actually know <laughs> patent law. I was a, I'm a patent lawyer. I'm like – anyway, um, <laughs> I, um, I forgot where I was going with this, but <laughs> – Oh well, you were saying. Oh, oh no. So, so what they, they like Richard Epstein? What they say is, well, we admit that intangible property rights, like uh, uh, which is what IP is called, right, um, is not the same as property. But here's how you could view it as the same. Like for example, you can sell it, and it's got an economic value, and you can license it just like you can. I'm like, yeah, well. You know, slave owners in the eighteen in the seventeen hundreds could sell frickin' slaves too. <laughs> you, the, the legal system can c- treat things as property that they shouldn't, mm-hmm. and that doesn't mean that you should. Just because you can make an analogy and say, "Oh, you can treat humans as property too," so I, I guess that's okay. That's the kind of argument they're making in defense of IP, and it drives me bonkers. Yeah, that's uh, you know the one that that I think I hear as the most common argument. And I used to kind of I, – I, I'm almost embarrassed to say, but I used to kind of think maybe there was something to this until I read you just destroy it. But I, I think the, the most common argument I hear is something about either R&D or something about the idea that patents uh, like incentivize people to, to invent things. Um, but again, I, I know – so I'll just give you a chance to, to knock that one down because it's kind well, of a similar so thing. What's interesting about that argument is – Here's what I've noticed over the years of thinking about these issues and talking to people. I mean, as a basic point, which sounds condescending, but you have to realize that a question is not a freaking argument. Like if it, if I give you – I, I explain for 30 minutes to you, here's why the patent system is wrong, and then someone says, but how would I make profit doing this? It's like, well, okay, so that's not really a counterargument. It's just a question, right? Right. And some questions are wrong-headed. I mean, I could say why slavery is illegal, and someone could say, "Okay, I hear all your points, but who's going to pick the cotton?" It's like, well, <laughs> I mean, dude, I don't know, and I don't care. I don't have to prove to you what the world's going to look like in 50 years after slavery is abolished, and we don't have uh, African slaves to pick the cotton anymore. It, it really doesn't matter. I mean, I can guess, but my argument doesn't depend upon that, right? So, and the other thing is that. There's this assumption when people ask these questions and when they make some of their arguments that the purpose of law is to fine-tune basically market you know, uh, market failures, I guess, and, in, and, and slightly f- increase market efficiency by remedying defects that they, they imagine would happen without the government coming in and doing this. So like there's an assumption that we don't have enough innovation. We have this much innovation, but we need this much, and if the government will come in and fix these free rider and holdout problems with the system of patent and copyright law, we'll have slightly more innovation. But the, beside that being totally false, the purpose of law is not to increase innovation. The purpose of law is to do justice and protect people's rights, which just means property rights, which means we have to identify what our property rights are and have the law respect and defend them, but it's not to increase innovation. So that, to me, that's the biggest problem. And then the idea that the government could even get this right ever is crazy. I mean no one even knows what the right term should be. In fact, the funny thing is – so copyrights last over 100 years now, roughly 120, let's say. Patents last about 17 years. If you ask an advocate of patent or copyright, why should patents last 17? Why not 12? Why not 11? Why not 100? Why not zero? They have no answer. Mm-hmm. In fact, Ayn Rand was asked this question. That was in her, her one of her, her most embarrassing mistakes in her book Capitalism: The Unknown Ideal. That article on patent and copyright, and she said, "Well, we don't know exactly what the right term should be, but it doesn't matter as long as we have some finite term that's, you know, better than zero. I guess is her argument. You know, the libertarian argument to patent and copyright and the optimal term, because I've heard I've, I've said that the optimal term is zero. And I'll hear libertarians say, well, you said that 17 is an arbitrary number, but zero is an arbitrary number too. I'm like, no, that's because I know it's evil. That's like saying the, arbit- the optimum se- prison sentence for drug uh, use is not 10 years or 15 or 5. It's freaking zero because the drug war is immoral and wrong. Right. I know zero is the right answer. Yes, I do know. And you can't tell me what the right sentence for someone – uh, smoking marijuana is. It's not five or ten or two or three months probation or whatever. 
all those things are too much. It Just is, like taxes. Every tax is too much. It's, it is almost like – and I'm, I've never been like a big Randian. Like I, I – you know, I got brought into the movement by Ron Paul. You know, like I came along later, and so I was yeah. brought in by Ron Paul, and then I found like the Mises guys and Rothbard and all those guys. So by the time I started reading Ayn Rand, it, it, like I like I like her novels and stuff, but it just didn't like – I never felt like this like allegiance to her or anything like that, but it still even kind of hurts. Like it hurts when those people who I do look at as heroes, even if they're flawed heroes, it's like it's so – when they whenever they try to – argue against like a voluntarist society or something it's just it's almost like painful because it's like you've been so on the mark for 95 percent of your work and then in this other five yeah. percent i remember i saw this thing um it's like a video this is like less than a year ago i forget exactly where it was but uh walter williams was was giving a speech and then he took questions afterward. And now we live in this post Ron Paul internet world where there's, there's, you know, at any event like that, there's going to be a bunch of ANCAPs out there who are like asking these questions. And Walter Williams, who I do look at, is like a hero, you know, and he's like, he's yeah. like making all these, these great arguments. And, and he doesn't even say like uh, taxation is uh, theft. His argument is that taxation is slavery. And I've heard him break this down a lot of different times, and he's like, well, what is slavery other than right. one person forcibly taking the labor of another person and this whole beautiful uh, you argument? See, you see, wait, you see that labor? But you see, that's a good metaphor, but you see it's not quite precise because you see he's making a little bit of the labor – the Lockheed and Labor Theory yes. ownership. But anyway, yes, I right. kind of agree with him here in the application. But, but yeah, go but ahead. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. But anyway, so this is his, his argument, and he gives this whole speech. And then uh, this guy, it's like the first question. And this young kid is like a bright kid, and he gets up there and, and he asks, and he goes, well, you know, if taxation is, is a violation and it's theft or it's slavery or whatever, like what justification is there to, to tax for a military or for courts yeah. or for any of this other stuff? And Walter Williams goes, uh, well, it's in the Constitution. Yeah, and I remember yeah, just right. being like, it oh, like it hurts inside. I don't know. Yeah, it's or the Randians will say it's necessary. So – you know, they just can't imagine how you could have these competing defense agencies. So they think it's necessary. It's not a very good argument. I respect their anarchist, their anti-anarchist argument, a little bit more than I respect their anti, their pro-IP argument. Uh, I can see how you couldn't wrap your head around um, having no final legal authority, right? I could understand, and especially for the earlier thinkers, I kind of give them a break on that a little bit. Uh, they're wrong, but. But this IP thing, man, uh, I, honestly, there is – I have never come across a good argument for it at all, and I've heard – I think I must have heard every one. Um, I was going to ask you, what about this joke, the man on the moon? You're going to leave your, your listeners hanging? They're going to be all wondering, what was this man on the moon joke? Oh, You're not going to tell it? The man on the moon <laughs> is uh, the joke. It's a really funny joke. I'm probably going to butcher it. This is why I try not to tell other comedians jokes, but it's like more or less it's just like uh, that he goes um, – we put a, uh, you know, when they say we put a man on the moon is always used to like, oh, oh well, I'm sure we can do this. I mean, we put a man on the moon or, or it's like, you know, that they go like uh, they put a man on the moon, but they can't get my phone service right. You know, it's always that. And, it goes, uh, and he's like, well, I wonder if we had never put a man on the moon. People would just never be upset about things we couldn't do. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> the idea of just it's kind of like, oh, man, my phone service is terrible. He says, well, they never even put a man on the moon. So and it's, it's But it's really funny the way they do it. And it's just, but they have it's like identical. The two jokes they have. Hey, so we're running uh, close to, to the end of time here, but I did want to just ask you to expand a little bit on the point you made there, because I I would be remiss if I if I had you and didn't you know uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, law in an anarcho-libertarian voluntarist world, because as you said, that is the thing that people can't wrap their head around, and you gave them a little bit of a pass, but did say that they were wrong. This is something that I get a lot when people are first, you know, hear about the idea of, of anarcho-capitalism. They think, well, like, so you're against laws because the state and law are completely associated with each other. That is not actually true. We're, we're, we are in favor of, of laws, not most of the ones that we have currently, but how would you say, just you know, in a quick few minute kind of sum up, which I know this could be a whole podcast on its own, but how would law work? How would law be enforced in courts and stuff like yeah. that in a voluntarist world? I mean, this is actually a topic I haven't I actually haven't written a lot about this uh, because so much has been done on it already. Um, I sort of view um, a lot of libertarian thinking is arguing and thinking about what laws uh, make sense and what are justified, and that's kind of what I do. Uh, the system that would rise up and implement it um, is also interesting. It's a different question, um, and uh, I basically share the views of the main writers on this topic, right? and there's a lot of impressive ones. There's um, 
There's Rothbard. There's the Tannehills, you know, the Market for Liberty in 74, I think. Uh, Bob Murphy's written something recently about it and also his chaos theory. Gerard Casey is a, a brilliant um, – uh, Irish philosopher, libert anarcho capitalist Rothbardian, has this great book out um, discussing the stuff. Uh, 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 even Randy Barnett and um, um, uh, Bruce Benson. So the stuff by these uh, David Friedman too. These guys' stuff is what I basically agree with. So I, yeah, there's no way we can summarize it, but yeah, I think you would. If if we all agree what law makes sense because we can have justifications for it, and that's what we libertarians do, then the assumption is that that's what would be accepted in society too if you're basically a libertarian society. right? So, And even Hoppe has written on this stuff too. So what I think is more the, along Hoppe's lines that um, um, you're not going to have a free society unless people for some reason have adopted these basic norms. Right, and the ones that make sense are the ones that we believe in. That's why we believe in them. They make sense. So they would have to emerge. They would emerge by custom, by contract. They would be enforced ultimately, I think, by by people doing self help, but also institutionally by the arms of insurance companies. Right. So people would have, they would tend to have insurance to be able to make their way into given regions and areas and to join polite society. And the insurance companies have all these incentives to work with each other, establish meta rules and arbitration rules. Um, my personal guess is, even though I've written a lot on the theoretical right of a victim of aggression to use proportional retaliatory force, right? Like, you know, in theory, if someone commits murder, they could be killed or even tortured to death. Depending, you know, theoretically, you could justify this. I think in a practical, real-world sitting, um, I am personally drawn towards arguments that say we would have a mostly voluntary system. Um, and it wouldn't be enforced with uh, with lethal force after the fact. Most of the time, it would be a restitution-based system, and voluntary in the sense that if you don't want to show up in court, we can't make you. But then your your reputation, you're going to be an outlaw basically. Your life's going to be hell, and we can easily ostracize you and you know force you out of society. So people would have strong uh, incentives as long as they're part of a growing uh, free society. Um, to comply with these rules and to be a reasonable, civilized person, and if they're hauled into court for some proceeding, they would they would show up and they would make their case. And usually, the remedy would be restitution or some kind of something that, if it was a, a violent crime or something really bad, would give them a way to integrate themselves back into society. Right? Something. Um, I, I think that's how it would work. And Randy Barnett and others have written a lot on this. I've written a little bit in blog posts why I think that would happen. So I think that even though technically there's a right uh, for eye for an eye type punishment or retaliation, I don't see that being um, done institutionally. That is by the private agencies that would arise because it's just too expensive. It doesn't accomplish much, and it's too risky because you could make a mistake. Right. right. If you execute an innocent guy, then what do you do? Uh, um, and, and who does it really help? Who's going to pay for that? So I think restitution would be way more um, accepted in a free society. And plus, I think crime would be lower anyway, so it wouldn't be as much of a problem. And when we all have super nanobot robot swarms around us that protect us from any possible <laughs> uh, harm, we won't. <laughs> maybe no one can hurt each other in the in the far future. You know, we'll all have invincible little robot bee armies around us. Yeah. Okay. I, I yeah, to be a little techno optimistic, you know. Yeah. No, I, I like that. I, let's end with some optimism. I, I, I do. I, I, I really agree with everything you said there, and I think, um, you know, it's interesting, and I get it. I get it because I think there's this natural tendency for people to accept whatever system they're in as the norm, and 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 be worried about changing it. But it's like, you know, it's it's amazing to me how much people get caught up on this thing, and it's like, oh my god. I mean, we wouldn't have a state, and then we can't force people to show up for court. We have to just make them outlaws or outcasts, and it's like, yeah. You you know, I know it's a little bit scary, but you know, when you have a state, you know, you end up having like world wars, a military draft, exactly. robbing from your entire population, throwing people in a cage for pot. So maybe it's better to go with the with the risk of, of too much freedom <laughs> or whatever. Um, anyway, listen, man, we got to wrap because we're over time and, and we have other people coming into the studio after us. But, uh, dude, this was great. Thanks so much for coming on, Stefan Kinsella. Uh, please let people know where they can find more of your work and, and what your, your next projects are. I'd say the clearinghouse is just Stephen Kinsella with an A, not an E. That's Stephen. And I just want to tell you, I, I was debating with my family whether you're the smartest funny guy or the funniest smart guy. And I think we have to go with 
probably the smartest funny guy because otherwise Bob Murphy would be upset. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I appreciate that very much, and, and I really enjoyed this episode. We'll have to do it again soon. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. I will be, uh, like I said, I'm going to Los Angeles, so uh, uh, my next episode will be uh, on the road, but it'll be at normal time, Friday at 6 p.m. All right. Thanks, guys. Peace.